Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jack Waghorn, who's going to be discussing social housing. So, big round of applause for Jack. Hey, everybody. How's it going? So, yeah, I've, I've kind of put together a bit of like a radio essay. This is pretty much just going to be me talking about my research. I have a kind of like ugh, three quarters of the way through research project done. Not much of an outcome, but I'm hoping to sort of like carry this thing on afterwards. But I've been enjoying looking into my, um, my uh, topic of social housing and have been kind of really interested in seeing how that... Um, feeds into these uh, economic ideas that we've been sharing over the past month and a bit. There's been some good conversations in the um, studio and everything, so it's been kind of interesting. interesting. But yeah, okay, so in this talk, I'm going to be discussing how a healthy relationship um, between social housing sector and government can ensure that cities are providing affordable housing uh, and can create uh, a kind of a beneficial um, sort of structures for the economy and why striving for a sustainable balance between state intervention and free market pol policy when it comes to housing shouldn't be overlooked as a way to bring about wealth, equality, and equal opportunity. What I hope to propose by the end is less of a radical intervention in the form of an envisioned economic model, but is to offer a reformist approach to, providing, to improving welfare under neoliberalism. So I'll provide a bit of background in my research. Um, there's an inherent ideology present in economics. Unlike physics, for example, economics is a social science. The economy is embedded in society. It's in the household, it's in care, it's in commons. It's dogmatic, it's ph philosophical, and it's stuck within historical context. Um, in Kate Rathworth's, I think I've said that right, uh, donor economics, she questions what is missing from the way mainstream economics is practiced. Uh, which led me to think about how we can reclaim the political power that's present in e economics and rethink what the economy means. Um, political intervention in the economy already exists, but political intervention in the market is becoming increasingly weak in Western European social democracies. Political intervention in the market comes in the form of regulation and uh, provision. The example at the center of my research is social housing which in the context of a social democracy in the West falls under the category of welfare. So by examining social housing, I hope to unpack what the economy means in the case of welfare state capitalism. Uh, in social housing, property is owned by a central or local authority. Social housing refers to rented properties which may be owned or managed by non-profit organizations um, with the aim of providing affordable housing, usually to those with low incomes. Uh, social housing can also be seen as a potential remedy to the housing inequality, and proper provision of affordable housing is an economic benefit because it frees up disposable income, but crucially creates equality and opportunity and class mobility. Um, so lots of my research took place in Amsterdam because that's where we are based, where our school is located. And the Netherlands has a rich, hitch, rich history with social housing uh, which is why I thought it was such an interesting topic to look at there. Today, there are 2.4 million social rented dwellings in the Netherlands, rented out by 360 housing associations uh, and private non-profit organizations, which are all under state uh, supervision. So that means 31% of national housing stock is social housing, meaning in relative terms, the ne Netherlands has the largest social housing sector in Europe. Um, but taking a step back, social housing in the Netherlands all began as a private initiative in the middle of the 20th, 19th century. And in the beginning of the 20th century, the political climate of the liberal policy changed, so the state took more of an intensive role. Um, the national government decided housing is a state responsibility. And in 1901, the first Housing Act was introduced, leading the way for housing associations to be born and to receive subsidies to build dwellings which are aligned with the conditions of the state. Uh, there's a great museum in Amsterdam called Het Schip. I probably pronounced it really badly, but I visited that uh, a few weeks ago to see for myself the, um, uh, the fruits of the Housing Act uh, coming about and to better understand social housing uh, in the context of the Netherlands. Uh, it's a housing, the Het Schip is a housing estate located in the west of Amsterdam, designed by architect Michel de Klerk. It's one of the first estates to kind of spring out after the Housing Act. 
um, built in this Amsterdam school expressionist sort of style. Um, and in the first half of the 20th century, de Klerk and others, other architects, built surging housing project, projects with subsidies from the council. Uh, from the 1950s to the 1970s, the associations became more institutionalized and became less, um, more or less components of state operations. In the mid-1920s, in line with its neoliberal agenda, the national government privatized the associations. The associations had always been private, but now they're financially separated from the government. Now, housing corporations would make their own choices about which type of dwellings they would like to be constructed and for what segments of the population. The associations of the 90s became hybrid organizations that carried out public tasks, but also had a market orientation. The associations offered housing to any household, irrespective of the position and background. And in 2008, the government introduced um, an, uh, an income limit for those who would qualify for social housing, and also introduced the landlord levy, which I'll come back to in a bit. Uh, in 2015, the New Housing Association Act meant that there was now a complete separation from the state and the market, and the Amsterdam Housing Association uh, had to sign this multi, this agreement with the um, Amsterdam municipality. Um, so my research into all of this took me to think about what sort of institutions were um, present in these kind of structures. Um, so I visited this guy, Daniel Bender, of the FCWC, F AFWC, uh, which is this umbrella organization. Um, but I'll continue. So this gradual drawback and the power of the housing associations meant that the associations operating today can set their own rent levels, their policy makers, to the extent that they can decide who operates, who they operate for, and how they want to allocate housing. And they have targeted groups, which primarily uh, are low-income households. And the current way in which housing associations are financed is through, solely through investment and bank loans from the Dutch state. Um, but ultimately, they're non-profit organizations, which means the Dutch so social housing sector is a closed system in which all revenue is reinvested. Um, so the AFWC is the umbrella group under which all of these housing associations in Amsterdam operate. They act as a platform for the associations to act co cohesively and operate more or less the same. Um, in a conversation with Daniel Bender, who's a data analysis at the AFWC, we discussed the future of the organization and the current discourse of social housing in Amsterdam. Um, we discussed the problems that they are facing and discussed uh, the European Commission's um, influence on the way they operate and the European Commission's influence on the liberalization of the housing, social housing sector. One of uh, Daniel's colleagues, Jerome van der Veer, who operates as a policy advisor at the AFWC, made a contribution to Urban Europe, 50 Tales of the City, a paper published in 2017, which contains stories of modern European cities um, to quote, in the Netherlands, the government now aims to reduce the social rented sector in favor of the private sector, rented and owner occupied homes. The social rented sector, so the idea goes, should confine itself to the core task of providing housing for those with low incomes. In other Western countries too, we see reforms in the welfare state leading to a reduction in the target group for social housing. He goes on to say the European Union plays a, an important role in the three issues relating to housing a stronger con containment of low-income target groups, the separation between state and market, budget agreements, and spending cuts. In the new Housing Act that came into force in July 2015, the number of activities that the associations are allowed to carry out was strongly limited. This involves, among other things, the effort, to, effort of associations to provide housing for middle-income groups, project development, and, providing ma and maintaining the livability of neighborhoods. Moreover, associations must take a strict separation between their social activities on one hand and their market activities on the other. So overall, there's a quite a bleak um, and critical sort of stance of the European Commission, but he, finish, he signs off with, the, with this. The Dutch landlord levy is disastrous for the viability of social rented housing sector. We can identify, identify a paradox here. The government policy forces the housing associations to maximum rent increases, while at the same time the government believes the housing associations should focus only on rented, renting out social 
rented housing to people with low incomes. The landlord levy should thus be abolished as soon as possible. So this is kind of where my research has led me up to now. Um, I think moving forward, I need to uh, kind of work out a bit more of a sustainable model that uh, social housing, uh, so, well, housing associations can sustain themselves financially and if there is some sort of hybrid um, uh, model for them to be able to yeah, provide um, welfare, which is kind of looking after the most important um, basic needs of society, but is also kind of sustaining itself in this social market um, economic model. So that's kind of my research, and I will hope to update with something a bit more proactive. And I, it's definitely not any sort of radical idea, but it's a... Uh, a little view into what I've been up to for the past few weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jack Waghorn. Uh, do we have any questions for Jack? From the crowd? Oh, we got one question from Lauren. Hi, Jack. Hello. I have a question. Shoot. Um, so you spoke to this organization. Yes. Uh, what was it called again? Amsterdam? It's the AFWC. It's Amsterdam Ooh, Federation... Woning Corporati or something. Okay. And are they doing research on social housing? Yeah, so they conduct research. Um, and there's, I think there's 14 people in the organi organization, so they're not massive, but they do kind of outsource and work with universities and collaborate with all the bigger housing associations to kind of, yeah, gather research, analyze data, and advise on how to move forward. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions or did you think of any suggestions now, social housing um, is controlled by the government. I, I mean, they, they own a number of... Um the government don't... They kind of... The government's... Um, the, the only part they play really is uh, deciding on the threshold, on the limit of like what uh, income you have when you can qualify for social housing. Uh, but the rest are... All the organizations are not kind of state-run. Um, okay, yeah, they're, they're housing corporations. Yeah. Okay, so could, could you think of any other suggestions for distributing the uh, housing or, I mean, maybe you'll still work on this, I hope, yeah. but, but did you have any other thoughts about how this could be possible? So it seems like, I think realistically, it seems like having um, private non-profit organizations seems like it's the most practical way of operating with a market that exists in, in like a European city. And it seems like having such a, or having a bigger state control over, over who, does, who gets social housing seems like it wouldn't really work practically for um, having like a thriving market. Mm. So I can't see any other way of doing it than it kind of operates now. But I think there are better, better ways the government can ensure that um, social housing associations have like a healthier sort of, um, yeah, just are healthier financially. Hmm. Okay. Didn't really answer the question, but yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jack, again. If we can Cheers. see him, there he is. There you go, thanks, Jack. I have, a, I have a bonus. I have a bonus thing. Oh, go on. So I'm gonna introduce someone else okay. now from the I crowd All right. to come up, and I'm gonna be asking them questions. So we have Jerry Mantra here in the audience. Can everybody put their hands together for Jerry Mantra? <laughs> How are you, Jerry? Hey, Jack. I'm doing just fabulous. Uh, really great talk. I enjoyed it uh, immensely, and I think Thank that uh, the audience did too. I don't think I'm alone in that sentiment. It's really great to be here. Yeah, it's great. Really great to see you. So, who are you? Can you remind us? Oh, yeah. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Jerry Mantra, and I am a solutions-based practitioner. Uh, my good friend uh, John actually reached out to me and asked me to to speak here. He's doing a project on economics and thought that I would be a good resource to tap into for this uh, radio environment. What is a solutions-based practitioner? Right, that's a good question, Jack. So a solutions-based practitioner, uh, that's what I call myself, and, and what I do basically is I offer practical advice and solutions uh, to solve the things that afflict people. And what do you mean by afflict people? 
Right, so what I mean by affliction, um, let's see. Well, I think Klondike Benjamin said it best when they said, afflictions are what ails you and brings you pain. And it is my belief that pain, well, it's a mindset, really. And it can be overcome when the right techniques are put to use by an individual. Uh, right now, I have devoted myself to providing solutions to the variety of afflictions related to what I call SCCGS. What's SCCGS? Well, that's a good question, Jack. I am glad that you posed it to me. SCCGS stands for Systematic Consumer Complicity Guilt Syndrome, and it affects millions of people across the globe, many of whom are unaware that they are even suffering from this condition. I believe firmly that I have been called upon to spread awareness of the scourge of SCCGS so that I may educate and heal people. You see, solutions to SCCGS are actually quite simple and straightforward. Okay. And um, how do I know if I'm suffering from SCCGS? What are the symptoms? So uh, you may be suffering from SCCGS if one or more of the following symptoms apply to you. And these symptoms include trouble sleeping, trouble waking, <laughs> tight stomach, irritable bowels, gastronomical inflammation, ill-defined resentments towards yourself and others, swollen feet, suicidal thoughts or feelings, halitosis, loss of appetite, ringing in the ears, voices in the head, mortification, nighttime suffocation, intrinsic hollowing, and the list goes on, really. It's quite an extensive list of symptoms for SCCGS. But if one or more of the followings of those symptoms do apply to you, you may be suffering, and uh, it may be of value to you to look into my system of practical solutions. Can you talk about the solutions you come up with? Sure, I sure can. So I have come up with a series of uh, practical solutions, like I said, as a solutions-based practitioner, and they're really quite simple and straightforward. And right now, uh, in progress, I have a series of uh, sort of instructional videos, and they're set to launch very soon. And these act um, sort of as a way to introduce people to uh, my techniques. And one of my favorite is a bit of a meditation style. And it really, it, it all is very simple. All you need is to find yourself a little plot of supple ground and maybe a spade. And really, it just starts with digging a hole. And even the process of digging is one of physical labor. Uh, you're burning off endorphins. You're burning off calories. It gives you time to yourself to think. And what you're going to want to do is just dig a hole about the size of your body, laying down lengthwise. Uh, and depending then on uh, sort of the height up to the tip of your nose from the back of your head, you're going to want to have a depth that meets around that. So uh, you're going to dig a hole about the size of your body, and you'll lay down in it, and then just cover yourself in dirt. And I would recommend laying there underground for, oh, probably 45 minutes to two hours. And this technique is best when done, I would say, weekly or bi-weekly, depending on your schedule. Now, that is just a good all-around sort of technique. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow you, as an individual, to take responsibility for the choices that you've made as a consumer. And really, it's going to alleviate all of the stresses that come along with those choices. Will I need a tetanus jab? I'm sorry, a what strap? A tetanus jab? A tetanus jab. Mm -hmm. You know, it would not hurt to get a tetanus jab before you did this. In mm -hmm. fact, I would definitely recommend consulting your um, medical advisor mm. uh, before undergoing any of my processes. It is good to be in communication with professionals. Um, another one uh, of my solutions, if I may demonstrate, is um, it, it actually has to deal with um, maybe how to alleviate the pressures felt after using a plastic bag. So, right, um, I think many conscious consumers like to go about their day with a, a canvas bag, like this one that I have brought with me today, right? It's a very sustainable way of getting your groceries or what you need from the pharmacy. But, you know, life is busy and hectic, and you can't always predict when um, you're not going to have it on you, really. It's what it comes down to. And this world is one that thrives on convenience. So what I have developed is a little bit of like a, a breathing technique. And, um, and I'll demonstrate. So you'll take the plastic bag that you bought. Mm -hmm. 
And it's really quite simple and straightforward. You will just place the plastic bag over your head. And then I would recommend just breathing in and out slowly, slow inhales through the nose, and exhale through the mouth. That's a technique that you can re repeat really as, as many times as you want. It would be good to maybe have a friend in the room with you, um, but that is just a good breathing technique. And you'll find that afterwards, you will not, um, it will not bother you uh, whatsoever that you have just used a plastic bag. So how do you feel now that you've just uh, demonstrated that for us? Do you feel like you've um, relieved any of your, yeah, your guilt from your, your Consumption habits. I am totally guilt-free. I feel clean as a whistle jack, and mm -hmm. uh, I would really recommend this technique to really anybody who's willing to give it a shot and who feels that they're suffering from SCCGS. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. You're quite welcome. So are you, uh, are you on the gram? Where can we find you? Yeah, so if you'd like to hear more from me and see what I have coming up with my paid video projects, you can check me out on Instagram. That is at Jerry Mantra. That is at symbol J E. R-R-Y-M-A-N-T-R-A. That is at Jerry Mantra, and that is on Instagram. And just follow me, and be sure to like and subscribe all of my content. And um, I promise that together that we can make it a more guilt-free world, and we can all be living clean. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Jerry. Good to see you, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, of course you can ask oh, great. some questions. That's good. Yeah. Uh, we just got five minutes. It'd be great to ask some questions before you go. Please um, go for it. I know we were discussing earlier. I know Mali had a question earlier. Would you be okay to ask that again? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I I think I do suffer from. Is it SSGC something? SCCGS. Okay. I think I am suffering from that uh, mainly because every time I buy a plane. Uh, I get a lot of anxiety. I've been hearing a lot about how uh, bad they are for the environment, but my family lives abroad, so I kind of have to do it. Yes, I see. Yeah, those giant steel birds, they do burn quite a lot of fuel. And uh, But uh, I appreciate your family values, and that isn't necessarily something that one wants to compromise. you got to see mom and dad and cousins and all that. So in order to alleviate the SCCGS related to um, international flights, or even domestic flight, really... Uh, what I would suggest is get yourself up to a height of a certain point, maybe a first story window. And what I would suggest doing is really um, jumping out of the window onto the ground. Now, what you don't want to do is break any bones, but a little bit of pain is good, um, as that pain will replace, it is actually sort of what replaces the guilt. So you're going to want to replace the guilt with physical pain, especially in this particular instance. And I think that that's going to do just super for you. Well, you're very welcome. Th thank you, Jerry. Uh, is there any more questions? Well, I think we have time for one more question for Jerry. Oh, no. I, one more. So the techniques that you are describing, are they, can I also like use them for other kind of guilt? It is not maybe necessarily connected to consumption? Or maybe they don't work then? I think that these techniques are effective in a wide or variety of ways. They're... Um, yeah, they're far-reaching, and I think that if you have other sorts of guilt that you're looking to alleviate, then I would definitely recommend looking into my videos. They're not very expensive, and it's a, it's a really reasonable price. And um, I think that for what you're paying, you're going to get some solutions that you're going to be very happy with. All right, could you maybe repeat quickly the address I find you? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. That's at Jerry Mantra. That is at J-E-R-R-Y. M-A-N-T-R-A, that is all one word, lowercase, at Jerry Mantra on Instagram. And I do really appreciate every follow, every comment. I would love it if you subscribe to me. We can interact on the web. And, you know, that's the way that we're going to have a better world. And it's really clean living. That's what it's all about.
Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, now, uh, now next we have Tom Burke coming up. And Tom Burke's going to be talking to us through meditation, I believe. Is Jerry still here? Jerry, can I ask you a question? Did, did you make it in time for the, the sound bath? The I sound bath, sorry, that we, we staged earlier. Yes, affirmative, my friend. I was here for that beautiful sound bath. Uh, and uh, how did it make you feel? Well, the sound bath offered me a sense of ease for my worried mind and a stillness in my heart. Thanks, Jerry. You're very welcome. My name is Tom Burke. I'm from Watford in the UK. It's wonderful to be here in Istanbul. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm going to perform you some music in a little while with my friend Ryan. But first of all, I want to talk to you about transformation. I want to talk to you about stories. And I'd like to suggest that it might not be a bad thing to find ourselves going around and around in circles. Why transformation? The famous quote that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And in that sentence, I think about the word imagine. Why is it so hard to imagine change? Gloria Ansaldúya, poet and philosopher from the Mexican-Texas border, spent her life writing about transformation, about the marginal, and the in-between. She wrote, periods of being lost in chaos occur when you're between stories, before you shift from one set of perceptions and beliefs to another, from one mood to another. When overwhelmed by the chaos caused by living between stories, activist George Monbiot picks this up. He says that the financial crisis in 2008 gives us an opportunity because the old story ended. The financial system fell apart in front of us, and yet the imaginative failure since then has been to provide the new story. He sketches out how these stories work. In Hollywood, they always say there are three, seven, twelve, I don't know how many types of stories, but one of them is the restoration narrative, and it always works in the same way. The land is beset by a set of crises. A hero comes along and shows the people the way to rise out of it and head onwards and upwards. You can sell anything with this story. This is how they sold communism. This is how they sold social democracy. This is how they sold neoliberalism. Monbiot says, this is how we will sell the next story. And this is the point at which I disagree. Mythologists call this the monomyth. And I have a few problems with the monomyth. First of all, it relies on a hero. It might be Jesus Christ, it might be someone in this room, but when we think of the singular hero, it makes it hard to think of a networked group of individuals. The monomyth is all about the future. What if the future is already happening? The monomyth is about moving onwards and upwards. It's linear and it's about growth. Here's where we get to economics. It's pretty simple. We need to decouple ourselves from the growth principle that underpins economics, neoclassical economics, as it's commonly taught. We need to move away from growth, and we need to find ways of telling stories. We need to move away from growth and head to circular systems. We need to find ways of telling stories that are no longer linear, but circular. We need to look to meditation, to song, to poetry, this might sound abstract and impossible in the context of economics, politics, government, and management, but not so. Enter Stafford Beer, who Joe mentioned yesterday, systems manager, famous for the CyberSyn project. His whole theory, he called it viable systems, was about management that is about balanced feedback.
feedback loops. This is the diagram that he made. It's based on the human body. Each system is not only complete within itself, but it's recursive. through homeostasis, through shivering and sweating. The other thing about Stafford Beer was that he was a yoga teacher, he was a poet, and he wrote songs. When I first opened his book, I was delighted on the first page to find what he called the cost-benefit analysis song. Ryan and I I've realized a version of that that we'd like to perform for you now. have run through our fingers and how many credos believing in mine how many have led into unthought of dangers and how many grapes went into the wine thank you One more point before I finish, which I forgot to mention. In a recursive system, there are no externalities. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. Um, do we have any questions for Tom? Lauren always has a good question. That was really great. I, I can't think of a, a smart question. Um, 
Tom, could you repeat the last quote that you just said for us, just so I can sure. have that ringing in my head again? And I can explain it a bit more. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the slide at the... We have a habit of uh, analyzing a particular system without thinking about the way in which it's related to others, which is where this idea of externalities come from. When I drive my car, I pay for the petrol, I pay for the car, I don't pay for whatever happens when the, you know, the pollution that's caused is the gas that goes into the air. Whereas in, if we think about it, something more like the human body and a circular set of uh, self-balancing systems, it's inherently ecological. There's nothing that's not connected to anything else. So what you're proposing is like a more wholesome look at how things are connected, interconnected. Absolutely, yeah. A move towards thinking, instead of thinking about uh, economics and growth, a move towards uh, a holistic management system. How can we sign up? Or is that Jerry's job? <coughs> well, actually, if you go to the next um, slide, yeah, uh, or the, the, the degrowth, I think another, the, the point of the um, moving away from the linear narrative is that it's not necessarily something that you sign up to in terms of uh, something that's focused around a particular uh, point of gravity. It's probably something that's already happening. And uh, you would sign up by uh, thinking about what's happening in the commons, what's happening in the household, and reading this book. You've read the book. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again, Tom. OK. That's it for today. Thank you very much for coming to day two of the School of Schools, the School of Individuals. Uh, School of School of Schools. Sorry, we can't get that confused. Come back tomorrow at 5 PM, where we will be doing the School of the Invisible. And we'll be talking to Alexander Cromer and Juhi Ham about the ocean, about work, le leisure, and rest. So hopefully, we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Happy Halloween.